The fifth question you ask yourself when doing educational analysis deals with the sequencing of knowledge. Uh, this follows pretty logically on from the selection of knowledge. After you've selected what it is that is going to be taught, well, then you have to sequence it in some way. Now, as with all the other questions, uh, it's a two-parter. On the first uh, side, ask yourself about the nature of the boundary strength in terms of sequencing. And over here, you're going to ask, is the sequencing determined? I.e., is there only one sequence which goes step by step by step? Or is the sequence open? By which we mean, uh, are there a number of possible sequences that you can follow as the lesson progresses? But at the same time as that, you also always need to try and understand how sequencing works in its own terms. And to do this, I'm going to try to show you two key ways that sequences work. The first way you can work on a sequence is by working out the conceptual relations, because that gives you um, uh, insight into how uh, sequences operate, and also inference relations, the joining mechanisms that force you to make certain micro steps as you move along. Uh, and these two uh, basic ways that sequencing work will give you some handle on how to analyze sequences when you come across them. Well, let's start off with uh, the uh, sequencing. Um, you can have a solid or an open boundary. With a solid boundary, what you have is you have a situation where what you, what you take as your selection you then sequence it in a particular order and it follows that sequence uh, in set terms. You go A, B, C, D, E, F. And you know that if you follow that sequence, it works. It's been tried and tested before. There's reasons behind the sequence being the way it is. Uh, and um, often teachers who are very experienced have their favorite ways of doing things because they know from experience that that particular kind of sequence works. Now a more open sequence has a situation where there's a number of possible ways you can follow the sequence and again good teachers tend to do this. Uh, they land up in a situation where they start off the lesson and suddenly they see that there's a number of possibilities uh, where the lesson could go with the next step and they know what the possible steps are and they know where the other possible steps go and by taking a second step it opens out a new possible set of sequences which again could branch out more and more and more. Uh, teachers have to have a really good content knowledge and a pedagogic knowledge or some people call it pedagogic content knowledge in order to be able to do this because you're working with a far bigger range or set of options when working with the sequence itself. Uh, bear in mind that neither the open or the solid kind of sequence uh, is a judgment tool at this stage. They're analytic tools. It's not that they're good or bad. It's that you're describing something, trying to recognize it as either being an open sequence or a solid sequence. Now, in order to get a grasp on how sequences work, I'd like to take you through a number of ways to understand uh, sequences. And the first one has to do with conceptual relations. Now, in terms of this, the best way to do it is to just get straight into it um, and to try and give you an idea of how it works. Let's say you start off with the situation where you are at level zero. Now notice what I've done. I've got le level zero in the middle. I've put level minus one underneath it and level plus one above it. And I've given them names or terms. Uh, the level that you're working on is a coordinate level. In other words, you can choose in your sequence where you are to move to something that is similar to it, but on the same level. And we call that a coordinate relation. You can also choose to go to something which is underneath it something that is smaller, something that uh, is a part, something that is an example, something that gives you the building blocks to understand what the higher level is. So from level zero, you could go down to level minus one to actually explain things through an example or through uh, breaking it down into its parts. You can also uh, move upwards. 
where you start off uh, with a higher level concept. And what that higher level concept does is gives you the basics by which you can actually understand everything that falls underneath it. And from the level zero, you could decide to move upwards towards that higher level concept because that is the concept that it's actually building towards. Now, this gives you the key basic functioning mechanism of a sequence. You can either move up, down or sideways. Uh, and if you grasp that basic point, you really have the heart of how sequences work. So, for example, yeah, we have a situation where at level zero, you have uh, crustaceans, uh, level minus one, you have a crab and level plus one, you have invertebrates. Now, my apologies to the biologists. I haven't gone through all the various assorted hierarchical classifications, uh, but I think this will demonstrate the point. Now, at the crustacean level, if that's the level which you're on, you could decide to stay at that level and give, a, uh, give types of creatures or animals which are similar to crustaceans. So, for example, insects, um, and uh, anthropod, uh, no, uh, spiders, for example, are very similar to crustaceans. They occur at the same level. Uh, you could move from crustaceans downwards into particular types of crustaceans, for example, crabs. Uh, and at the crab level, you could decide to demonstrate what other kinds of crustaceans are. So in other words, when you move down to level minus one, you could say crabs, and then you could move along uh, on the coordinate axis and say, well, you've got crabs, uh, you've got lobsters, for example, that would be an, another example at that level. Or from crustaceans, you could move upwards. Moving upwards, you could explain that they are invertebrates, uh, they don't have a spine, and you could juxtapose invertebrates if you're at that higher level to the coordinate level next to that, uh, which is vertebrates. So there you start to get a picture of how you work with hierarchical levels, and that gives you a sequencing pattern. But the problem is the example I've given you so far only really works with types of or kinds of and there's another very basic ordering pattern which gives you sequences and that is a parts of logic uh, where you move from uh, parts to whole. Uh, so for example with the parts of a crab you've got the cephalothorax uh, and that's the major part of the crab and the other major part of the crab is the abdomen which exists under the cephalothorax. Now you then could say attached to the cephalothorax. After that, you've got, for example, its eyes, its feelers, its pincers. And the parts of relation gives you another sequencing pattern as well as the types of relation. You could also, uh, in this situation, not only give uh, types or parts, you could also give instances, you could give examples. If you remember earlier when we were taking a look at Aristotle's classification and we were dealing with humans, you could have given examples of humans. You could have given uh, Aristotle, Plato, uh, Socrates, and I included myself in that set rather humbly. Um, in this instance, you've got uh, the situation where you've got Mr. Krabs. Uh, as a particular example of how it works. And in sequencing, often that's what happens. You move from a, a type or a part story to instances to show how that works. But an, another one which you have to consider is not only types, parts, uh, instances, but also the location relation, where it sits within. And what you start to do over here is you give the time, space, location of it. And that can start off with the local space and it can get bigger from the micro to the meso to the macro level locations. Now these all give you uh, insight into how at a conceptual level you work with sequences. It shows you how and why you move from one uh, section to another through those logical relations. Uh, I've got to be careful, sorry, when uh, conceptual relations. Because on top of the conceptual relations, you also have 
inference relations. Now these have to do with the nature of the logical links you make which take you from one thing to another thing. It makes you jump from one proposition to another proposition. And in the way that you jump, if you give the logical reason, the jump is obvious and the jump is easy. Now, to make sense of this, I've, I've gone back to uh, Mill, who's one of the most wonderful philosophers writing in the 19th century. Um, and what he uh, gave us were five rules of inference, which I'm going to work with four. The first one is one of agreement, and you can see it very simply. Uh, if you have a situation where you have four things happening, A, B, C, D, and something like E then happens, and then another set of situations happens where you have F, G, H, and C happening, and then E happens again. Well, you can make an assumption that it's the C which has caused the E to happen. So there's agreement between the first and the second around C. With difference, you have a situation where in the first instance, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D you have E happening. And then in the second instance, when something happens, you only have A, B, and D. You don't have C. And you know what happens? No E happens. And you can assume that you have no E because you didn't have C. Uh, and apologies to drug dealers on this, on this point. Uh, the next method combines agreement and difference. And this, when, 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 you have joint, uh, when you have a joint situation, you then know that you are working uh, with almost absolute certainty. So, for example, if you have A, B, C, and D, and E happens, you then have uh, F, G, H, and C, and E happens. So, C happens twice, E happens twice, and in the third instance, you have only A, B, and D, and then... Uh, no C and then no E, well then you're pretty guaranteed that there's a strong relationship between C and E. Uh, the fourth uh, logic uh, Mill talked about was uh, the concomitant one. And by concomitant he means that whatever the nature of the relation is in terms of its intensity, it tends to be matched by that intensity in the effect. So if in the cause situation you have A, B, C and D, and you have E, but E is around about the same size as C. Uh, and then in the second situation, you have A, B, D, and you have a big C, and then E gets bigger as well. Well, then you know that there's a strong relation, especially when you have a massive C in the third one, and you have a massive E uh, as a consequence. Then you can be pretty certain uh, that there are these relations around. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is because these are the fundamental ways that sequencing works. And in the example video, which we will do uh, after this, you will see that uh, key educators use these two techniques to sequence uh, their curriculum and to sequence uh, the pedagogic actions in the, in the classroom itself.